that's 90.3 FM on the dial. Anybody says any different, uh, don't believe it, man, because we are right here making an uh, impact in Orange County. We started off as a nonprofit, and we are working our way up, doing different events. We got another event coming in November. But first things first, man, I got the man, the myth, the legend, Brian Flores, man. WBC, is it Latin America champ or... or, or um, or how would you say that? Yeah, Latin American champion. All right, brother. And um, let me get this mic situated for you, even though, uh, you know, there, there you go. Perfect, perfect. Uh, yeah. Um, let me turn that up a little bit. Yeah, so um, I don't know if you want to scoot in a, just a little bit. There you go. Um, so I, I, guess, I guess I'd want to start here first because there's people out there that are wondering how you made it to where you're at now. I mean, there's a story behind everybody. And, you know, um, I know that the journey is not always easy. And um, so wh where are your parents from? My parents are from Mexico, uh, specifically in Oaxaca. Oaxaca? Mexico. Yeah, so my parents immigrated here when they were like 15, 16 years old. And then, you know, like I think like every common story, you know, they have kids and then, you know, they, they raise them, you know. Uh, I, I didn't grow up like in a in like the like the hood hood I would say right you know? right but like I I grew up ar around it you know I know I know what it is but I think it all comes down to the choices you make and and so and, would you so would you say are, so would you say you grew up in a middle class I mean I mean I grew up in Santa Ana like there's like you know there's gangbangers and stuff like that but I think I think it's um, a mindset too like you know if if you if you let those things get to you then you know that's where you're gonna become and or that's where you're gonna be influenced by just like any any place has its its bad habits right yeah i mean i mean i grew up in santa ana as well but uh, i was born in orange grew up in santa ana and then moved to garden grove and i know that uh there's a lot of rich cultural history in santa ana and um like when you grew up in santa ana you grew up around your people obviously um you know traveling the world has it made you uh, look at things a little bit differently when it, in terms of like um, like appreciation for uh, you know where you grew up and how you did things? Yeah, I mean, I, I was born in Santa Ana and I moved like out of like out of there when I was like what like ten, twelve. So I, I oh, grew wow. up in Orange too. So I, I grew up in different cities in Orange County. So I really am from like all over Orange County. Again, number one radio station here. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Number one radio station, ninety point three FM, man. And and we appreciate you coming down, man. So. Um, I really think it's important that you know because I met you, I met you through uh, Flaming Hots. Yes, yes. And, and He's Flamin my trainer. Ha yeah, Flaming Hots is an awesome guy, man. Him and Jonathan Guevara, both of those guys are good friends of mine. And um, you know, I I, I got uh, you introduced to Abe. Shout out to Bugatti AP and uh, Jose. And um, we started talking boxing. But then, um, you know, I was I, I was uh, thinking like, man, this kid is is very sharp. Like, I, you know, to compliment you, I was like, this kid's very sharp. He's I know you deal with a lot of other musicians, but I, I felt it's important, like, when you meet people and you see people, uh, I, I met you as a champion, but I was like, you know what, I, I want to get him in here so he could tell his story and just get a good interview for, for the public and, and let people know where you are. Because people see you probably on ESPN or on TV, and, uh, you know, I, I just want to give people the backstory to that. Yeah, yeah, I, I feel like right now in my career, I'm... I'm starting to have my bigger fights, you know. I'm starting to finally get that exposure, but I've been putting in the work for years. And what's your What's your record? My record right now is 17 and one. I fought uh, last week. I won by decision. Oh, nice, man! Yeah, it was on uh, te televised on ESPN Mexico, so I'm I'm finally getting those TV fights. I'm getting those placements. So little by little, my name is getting out there. So I'm I'm just getting ready for my bigger fights, and I feel that my whole life has been just aligning, and it's you know it's it's coming together. So I'm really excited. I'm really happy and. I really appreciate this, any support I can get from the people just because, you know, that's that's who, who you are. You're, you are who your fans, uh, who support you. Yeah, for sure. No, no, no doubt about it. Um, so going back to, uh, let's, let's, let's rewind a little bit. Let's go back to when your parents grew up in Santa Ana. Dad, dad was a working, working guy. Yeah, I mean, like, um, I don't want to say like typical story, but at least here in Southern California, like, there's a lot of uh, first generation uh, Mexican kids, I'm, I'm Mexican, first generation Mexican kids that their dad, their parents work, both parent, working parents. My mom was a, a dental assistant, my dad a construction worker, like a typical uh, like job for uh, for an immigrant to come here. 
but they they work hard and they were very persistent so yeah i i uh i was born let's say like in like the like the rough area of areas of santa Ana, but yeah we qu- quickly moved out of there just because of the work ethic my parents had so i think that's something they instilled in, instilled in me from from very little so yeah i was going to ask you that like if any like watching your mom and dad if that kind of rubbed off on you a little bit and and made your work ethic the way it is now you know i i think subconsciously i've had a lot of experiences um in my life that thank god i'm not like traumatic but for example we would move like every every like two years we would move into a bigger house a bigger house a bigger house every two years just because we were like they were always hustling always, always upgrading so i was like my so that then that instilled in me in my head like okay every like two or three years i have to get better i have to be in a better position and that's how it always was and that carried through boxing that carried through like my sports like there's a a, con- a continuous flow of improvement that has to be given and if it's if it's not going there then that, that's that's when i feel like um out of touch and i have to reevaluate sometimes you know yeah no 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 doubt about it and i think sometimes we always have to kind of uh look at things and check ourselves and and you know come at least get a touch of reality every now and then um so when you're growing up what made you steer into the boxing world were your parents always like um supportive of the boxing or was that something you did on your own so so i tried different sports i i tried soccer i i mean it, it wasn't my passion I, I tried karate you know i got to like like a purple belt like two stripe but it, it just it just wasn't my thing and then I, w- I remember our family would always watch like um boxing fights so specifically like the barrera morales fights the pacquiao morales and barrera fights so like that inspired me so i think I, it was after i watched that barrera morales i think the second fight um, because they had a tr- trilogy, it was yeah. just an action-packed fight. I went to the gym like the following Monday. No way. Yeah, and then I started boxing. Uh, that was like I was in, I must have been thirteen, like seventh grade time around there. Yeah. Um, like school-wise, and then I started. I did it for like probably like five months, but you know, I I I was like picked on in that gym just because you know I was like a new kid and and I just I felt out of place. Right, and that was when I that was the, at right at the age where I moved from Santa Ana to Orange. So then, um, the I I, I quit boxing because I was like, it's not for me. You know, it's like it was just a bit intimidating for me. Yeah. And then the following year, probably towards like when I was like thirteen, going to fourteen, my mom was like, hey, there's a boxing gym here in Orange, and Orange is a more like you know it's a safer city. Right, like, right, right. Yeah, it's a little bit it's kind a of a middle class. Yeah, kind of middle class city. So I was like, I was like, nah, like I was like scared to go. My mom was like, no, just go. And at the time, I was like also kind of chunky, so she kind of wanted me to lose weight. Yeah, yeah, she was like, it's so very then I went there, and it was like a totally different environment, so I just kind of stuck with it from there. You know, it was kind of like my, my hobby. It was like my pastime. Uh, it was a place where, I guess, you know, you're, you're a kid. You're trying to, like, just, just like, kill time, I guess, right? So right. Like, I, I did that. I don't think it was ever, like, my, tr- my true love. I think that, like, slowly developed over the years over, over success. But, yeah, I pretty much trained myself. It was like a hobby, you know. I would I would get ready for competition competitions pretty much on my own with like the trainers that were available there, and like I told you before, I had always had that that urge to like ev- to get better every year to every year be be a step ahead or you know in a different position than the year I was before, and I just stuck to that mentality and you know, well, by the end of high school I, I was like competing at tournaments and then um, you know I started getting invited to invitationals and at be, fi- fighting like you know actual good fighters around the nation, so that's when I started like you know realizing like you know what i can you know do something with this as a kid did anybody ever challenge you like to a fight like hey you know what put them up man like you have any issues with kids like i mean in, in santa Ana, i went to school in uh in in i'm sorry i went to middle school in santa Ana, so like i mean did I you go to willard no I, w- I went to like the one of like the 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 more uh the magnet schools oh called, dang Men- oh, yeah, i'm called, down bro <laughs> yeah it was called mendez right but still like you know same, same kids maybe just you know more educated punches but you still yeah. fight with kids so yeah, yeah i had yeah. in a bunch of fights i remember but i was it, i was like an oxymoron because i remember like in fifth or sixth grade i got like the president's award like the like the principal's award the like the number one oh, really the smartest kid you know gets that and then i'd be hanging out with like the like the hood rat kids you know yeah yeah fights. so then the principal would like kind of like not want me to get in trouble so she would always like i remember give me slaps on her wrist there's one time i was fighting in lunch like I was punching this kid and and she just she grabbed my hand and like took me by the ear to the office and luckily she didn't like get me in, in big trouble but it was like she's so, like what's your GPA yeah so <laughs> I think I think they knew too you know they don't they don't want like to to stunt the growth yeah 
Yeah, but it was because of people like that. I've always been lucky, so I feel like you know I've I've always meant to to do great things. But then from from their middle school, going from like an all Mexican um, uh, environment, you know, that's a little bit like ho- hostile. Not like the best, like not super hostile either. You know, I'm not talking like hood hood, but like you know, yeah, enough where you build some skin. And then I I got a a full ride scholarship to all these boarding schools across the nation because I got into this program. No way. Yeah, so I I did interviews, pretty much like the Ivy Leagues of high school, right? So I got into like two or three of them. And then I was about to go to boarding school. And the only thing that kept me from going to boarding school was like my passion for boxing at the time. I was like, you know what? If I go to these schools, I I can't box. Yeah, yeah. There's no boxing. Yeah, like after school program, but it's not the same. So your passion really kind of started. I mean, if you're willing to sacrifice that for boxing, that just kind of is a testament to how much you love boxing. Yeah, I guess I don't. I've never really wanted to admit it up until like just recently, you know, because it was like my own thing. I, I don't want to like. I don't even want people to know that I, I fought because especially like in Santa, like if, if kids know you you box, they want to test test. Yeah, they want to test you. Yeah, they want to test you. So that was kind of like why like I kind of kept it to myself. But, but do you think it? Do you think like honestly? Do you think? it gets a bad rap like it says there's a stigma around boxing like yeah, hey if yeah. you if you're bo- if you're a boxer you're not intellectual do you think that people think that or yeah i i think so too but i think over the years people it's it started to change a little bit you know people uh see like like successful boxers to oh yeah to have successful careers i think floyd mayweather was you know a big part of that huge that, that, yeah a, a big part of that change but yeah there's still definitely athletes even that i know that are that are making money but i already know like down the line like i don't really see a, a big future for them just because there's only so much um ceiling they can reach right right um well i mean like look at well, i'll give you an example like uh mike tyson right mike tyson has a podcast you know prior to you know mike tyson being outspoken about boxing because i because i feel like recently he's kind of opened up a little bit more and yeah. talked about i mean i don't know if it was the dmt that did it for him but mm-hmm. I, I know that um you, you've, you've heard that he does all that stuff but yeah um he's opened up tremendously and he's had all these celebrities on and he's really went in depth about his life and like how you know people kind of did look at him like that they looked at him like the guy that talked funny and uh he was just like he's been punched in the head too many times and but really if you stop and listen to mike tyson he's very smart like he is tremendously like successful yes i think um at a certain point once you get to that world champion level you have to put so much into the craft of boxing especially in, in boxing what i found out over the years not only has it given me discipline but a lot of cerebral strategy right so i oh, yeah. strategize a lot so i find myself I don't, I don't know if it's because of my business or if it's because of, of boxing but i i definitely have like a strategy in my head always of how to get ahead or, or you're trying to like you know um, yeah, because it's very technical, yeah, right? Yeah, it's very it's very technical, and and what I like about boxing, honestly, it's I think even Mike Tyson said it like everyone has the plan until they get punched in the face. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, so you like, you, you can have the biggest plan. You can you can watch all the tape you want, but there's just some people that read you well. Yes, exactly. And and I like those moments of that's why sometimes I don't even plan things. You know, I I just show up and and I'm there and and then I see how I react and. Um, I think that's that's a great tool that boxing has taught me how to like think think on on the fly, how to manage my emotions, and I believe like that has helped me in life so in so many ways that I can't I can't even I don't even know examples of how because it's just a part of my life. Just, right. Just thinking fast, being witty, you know. Do you uh, think like uh, uh, when you get in a match, yes, like and you're looking at your opponent, the first round, are you kind of reading them, seeing what they're doing, and then in your do you automatically react to their body behavior, the way they punch, and and do you think it becomes second nature to you now that you have so many years in the boxing game that you just read it automatically and boom boom? Yeah, I, I think it, it comes with like seeing patterns. Everything in, in boxing is a pattern, and then I think the 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 hardest people I have the people I have trouble with are those patterns like I'm not used to reading as much. Right. Um, like it's like education. I'm a big believer in education. Oh, education, huge. Education not only in academics, but education in life, education in, in your sport. You have to notice it's your responsibility to notice these tendencies, and that's how you become a better fighter. Like I said, every year you have to get better and better, so you have to graduate from, you know, observing level level C tendencies to learning level B tendencies, you know? To yeah. Now I, I can I can react to things where, let's say, I'll – I know a punch that's coming, but I also know like the second punch and third punch. Wow, is that's amazing! Coming, you know, so like that's I, amazing. I know where to put like my hands up after I throw a punch, or I even know how to 
b- body language too is very important. So even when I'm like clinching with somebody, I can I can feel if like they're tired or I I hear their breathing. I don't have to like see them, but I I hear their breathing or it's just it's just very personal too. It's very intimate. You can right, say, yeah. right, yeah. yeah. And on another level, and um, I know you have that one loss. Uh, was that loss early in your career, or was that that, that was like my my fifth sixth fight? It was a split decision. Oh, it was a decision. Yeah, I I thought I, I thought I won, but I look back on it and I don't want to say like a eraser from my head because it was a learning experience, but it's definitely a stain on my on my record. And we've tried to fight that guy again over and over, but you know I think he's not fighting anymore, so it just kind of like sucks. That but but do you think that boxers need a loss to humble themselves? It, it de- everyone, it, it depends on on how you lose. I think I think if you lose, if you get your, like knocked out, that's a, a way tougher way to like bounce back. And then, for example, I lost by like a like a split decision. Like let's say it was controversial. Like it could have gone either way, right? Right, right. Um, the last judge maybe. Yeah. So it, it wasn't like I wouldn't say it was like a true loss to my ego where I'm like, wow, I right. Got, I got dominated. I got like you know. That's what I was trying to get at. Yeah, yeah. So th- this one didn't psychologically beat me down but i i it, it that that in itself was almost like a um um i almost would have wished that i would have had uh, would have had been dominated so i would have actually like you know bounced back with a harder emotion or you know have had those feelings of like you know what i don't want this again to happen because it did take a while to process that loss because i did feel that like, like like i won but then looking back and not compared to like my training schedule now, like the type of discipline I have versus when I first started, it's totally different, right? Right. Because when I first started, I didn't have as much support. It was just more me believing in myself, doing like just fighting, you know, having like a not even a real manager, just like having like, you know, just word word of contracts and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, where you don't you don't have any uh, sol- solid. Yeah, and the reason why I bring that up is because there's a lot of like. Um Mixed martial. I know it's a completely different story, and I I, I hate to kind of keep crossing those yeah. things, but it's just, you know, I watch a lot of that personally, and and I watch I watch boxing as well, but I always see these fighters, um, and uh, Sugar Sean O'Malley. He had a, he had a loss, um, and the loss was because he, in the middle of the match, he he hurt his foot. Now he went on to say, well. You know, I didn't lose, and and for and, and for many interviews after that, he wouldn't accept the fact that he lost. He tried to get a rematch that didn't happen, and now he's on. Now he's at a point where he still kind of denies the loss. But but I've also heard other fighters talk about, well, you know, sometimes, you know, you get because so, you know he's, he's his record as well. It's more wins than losses, and I've heard fighters say sometimes. I wasn't thinking in that frame of uh, thought or that mindset until I got the loss, and I kind of reevaluated my team, reevaluated the way I trained. But then I also see what you're talking about. Like if 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 you have a certain um, kind of discipline and and it's working for you, then maybe you don't need the reset button. You know? Yeah, I think at the time I still kept my same team um, and everything. It was just it was actually like after like my tenth, eleventh fight that I started working with Chris. He was assisting my my trainer, my at the time my current trainer, and he kind of slowly, you know, just started helping me on my legs, my movement, which which I started um, progressing as a fighter. Right. And I think I reevaluated myself when I I felt at a certain point I was like, wait, like I have I haven't been getting better. Like wh- like why am I not getting better? So that's when I, I started looking for the changes. So I think that's a, a great. Thing that I like about myself that I'm I'm um I'm self-aware, so I'm self-aware of the position I'm in. I'm self-aware of, of what I need to work on. So there, you can always work harder. You can always get better. Who but was your Who was your toughest opponent? My my toughest opponent. I, it, or could you could you not even like gauge I, that? I, I I can't. To be honest, I can't even gauge that because I feel like my my toughest opponents are barely coming. But like my second fight, um I I. Uh, I got a punch on my, on on like the top of my nose. Yeah. And like, like after the fight, like once the adrenaline came down, like my face got puffied up. Like that was probably the most fight where I actually felt like the most damage. My second fight, right? Um, but I my my both of my eyes were swollen. Like my nose was like bruised for three months. You know, that's when I felt like, like like the actual pain of a, of a punch. And that was just one one like good haymaker punch, right? That landed on me. Yeah. So, that kind of also pushed me to like you know work on defense, like not get hit. So. Um, I think my career, I've been more like tippy toeing on it, you know, um, just to prepare myself, kind of save my body too. You know? Right, I don't right. Have wars, you know, 
You well, I mean, it's like Floyd, right? Floyd never gets really hit that. Yeah, bad. yeah, yeah. Now, but when he started, yeah, he was like, you know, he he was putting in the work. Um, but it, again, it's like for me, my my thought process is obviously you want to go dominate every fight and and you want to win. But if I know I'm winning, if I know I'm dominating, I'll probably you know like take take it off the gas just a little, just so I can like save my 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 hands, or maybe not not risk myself getting cut or something like that. Um, Who's your idol? Who's your idol? Who's one of the the well, boxers it, it, you look so, up to? So it was it was Manny Pacquiao growing up because I had I've seen those Bar Barrera Morales uh, Pacquiao fights. I just I just the whole family would get together. He's not Mexican. He's Filipino, but like right. Yeah. Well, you don't have to like a Mexican fighter. I mean, uh, I mean, it, there's a lot of great. You know that our culture has a lot of great fighters. I mean, we are we are kind of the staple in fighting. Like, uh, I mean, there's a lot of fighters in every nationality, I guess, but. Um, you know, a lot of people say he's Cesar Chavez. A lot of, I know Flamin' Hots actually trained Junior, right? Yeah, he trained Junior um, for for a camp too. I was able to fight on that on that fight card when he trained Junior. That was actually like probably I'll, I'll probably feel it more looking back after a few years. Um, but we fought what during COVID, like the main event was the the father. Was there no audience? Uh, there was an audience. Oh no, wow! Just Did, you think that kind of you think the hype. I was gonna. I was gonna ask you about that. It's kind of a weird question. Does hype help in fights? I, I think it does help. I really do think it helps. It makes the moment probably bigger. Yeah. Because it was it was a little bit surreal. It was like we we went inside to fight in a room almost, right? It was yeah, that's, a, that's what I was gonna just say. Just cameras and stuff. The, the cameras did help. It made it better. But um, yeah, I fought with like on the card with Chavez Senior, Chavez Junior. You nice. Know, like that, that was like. You had a chance to meet him. Yeah, really? I had a chance to meet him, take pictures with him. I was backstage with him. You know, just being in, in like being like an actual part of the member of like that team and that posse yeah and and looking back um i think my dad was proud because he you know he grew up watching oh, Ch yeah. chavez you know so it kind of it, it kind of gave him some validation too you know that oh you know what maybe i did do a good job you yeah know, maybe but, my son is yeah, really serious about yeah this. I, I did a good job because that's like a like a dream honestly he's like a he i would say he was like the kobe muhammad ali of mexico right oh yeah for yeah, sure so he's, he's like an icon down there right yeah yeah he's an i he's like like a demigod so like me just fighting on the card with them you know i think that just brings great honor to like the, my family and 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 my people right oaxaca which are n normally known as like short people stocky not a lot of fighters come out of there you know I used to I used to kind of feel like that I used to do music back in the days and I used to always get hyped up when I was on the same card as G Unit or something like that right yeah. I'd be like man I, like this is the pinnacle of uh, underground artists um, but no I totally feel I, I feel that and even more so for you because you're actually talking to the boxes did he give you any advice yeah some some advice um, you know I, I you try to like like grasp everything that you can but I, I actually learned a lot um, so back to your question, like who was my idol, like Manny Pacquiao, yeah. right? So like, yeah. I watched him growing up. So then, um, after I finished high school, um, I had to choose colleges, right? And that's when boxing in my head was even more more serious. I was like, I, I gotta, go. I was like, okay, I gotta go to a city where boxing is top. So I was, it was either New York or LA. Wow. Preferably LA. So I applied to only schools in LA and New York. I got into Loyola Marymount, which is in on the west side of LA, but for the sole purpose to go train. In, in my head, I had a vision, like, I'm going to go train with Manny Pacquiao because he was training at Wild Card in Hollywood. So I was like, he's training there. I'm going to go there, and I'm going to train with him. Does, Fre does Freddie Roach run that uh, Wild yeah, Card? Yeah, yeah. Fre yeah, Fre yeah. So Freddie Roach's room, he runs that. So that was my vision. So then I went to school, and like I said before, I don't have a plan. I, just, I know where I'm going to get, but I just I don't have a – I don't usually have, like, a plan right away. So, you know, I get to school. Then I realized that the gym's like 45 minutes away from where I went to school. But I was oh, like, you know wow. what? The, the drive's worth it. Yeah. Went to uh, the gym. I, I met my trainer at the time, which was his name was Juan Jimenez, Superman, they call him. I'm an, a great amateur coach. So I met him at a boxing tournament before going to L.A., you know, and, and I had connected with him. He's like, yeah, I I'm, a, I'm the trainer at Wild Card. And, you know, he kind of um, was a contact for me to go in there first. So then... I did my I did I still did amateur fighting through through college because I I didn't I didn't go pro in college I did amateur fighting through college I got ranked number four I got uh, third place in the USA Nationals in like 20, oh wow 2011 yeah only I only lost at in that tournament I only lost like the the number one guy on the on on USA on the USA team so that's when I found out too that I was at a, like at a you know at a high level competing in the amateurs and that gave me the confidence to to turn professional. Um, just because I was like, damn, like I, if I, I'm like, you know, top 
top four in the nation like in my weight class uh, on the full college uh, schedule and working too like you know maybe you know i have a shot if i focus my my time more but that was i think over the years at, at wildcard the boxing gym in hollywood um, yeah where pacquiao trains out of um there's prof- there's like olympians world champions that go through to train sparring so i got to spar with like now like fighters like benavides i sparred a one shot oh yeah he's, he's in a way bigger weight class like he, uh, i think el Surdo ramirez too i fought i sparred him but these are people that like just showed up to the gym and like maybe in like two years they're like world champions right yeah like uh jose ramirez he i sparred him too so i was able to spar like very high caliber people and i think at first i was getting my butt kicked right just because you know i'm like 18 19 20 years old but you know i had a lot of balls i really did i i got in there with anybody and then freddie saw that so slowly he kind of showed me some love too so i would get tips from freddie learn stuff i learned mo- more in the sparring in that gym you pretty much fight three times a week against people no way yeah so it's, it's, it's like that's like regular when you're training for a fight yeah that's regular but um normally like anywhere uh in in any boxing gym you you um you, you go go to other gyms to spar right but that gym like you would have people like from japan come in one week from russia come in a week so you'd have people from all over the world come and I, I wouldn't have to leave the gym right so i learned a lot from those fighters like i had a world-class education in boxing you can say yeah um and i did like um all my college years i was four and i stayed after for like another five years i did like nine years at wild card holy smokes yeah yeah so i turned pro uh freddie roach was actually in my corner when i I did my pro debut so he helped me like you know that's 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 really awesome yeah that's actually history right there like to have freddie roach in your corner like that guy is a legend yeah so freddie roach cornered me like you know he he backed me up and and it was just cool because i was like the first Wildcard had a, a uh, was known for boxing professionals, but I was kind of like the first amateur to come from that gym. Actually, like you know, make it my home gym as an amateur because I was there for like four or five years fighting amateur. Yeah, and then turned pro, so I was like the first one to do it at Wildcard. Um, now more more fighters have followed, uh, but I was like the first one to do it. So I think that that's something that that made me proud because I thought about about it a few years ago. I was like pretty much like a walk on. It's like. Well, let's say wild card is like a like an Alabama or like a U. It's like a USC right type yeah. of college, you know. And and the USC football team, like they're they're stacked. They have like the best recruits in the world. And you know, I just I did a, I was like a walk on, and eventually, you know, I like over the years, I I worked my ass off, and I was able to you know be in sessions with like those world champions. I was able to like even show up to to those gym sessions where Pacquiao was there, right? So that's when my 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 vision started coming full circle. I, I wasn't in Pacquiao's weight class. So I couldn't spar with him. I, right. I'm sure if I, if I wasn't in his weight class, I would have. But I was able to be in a couple of training sessions with him, right? Like, see him come in. And that, to me, was full circle because that was my favorite fighter growing up. And then I was like, you know what? Like, I put it in my head that I was going to come here and train and train with him. And one day I did. You know, I was, like, running with him. I wasn't actually training with him next to him in, in the boxing gym. And to me, that was surreal. I was like, you know what? That taught me that all these – all these goals that I have, I can achieve. It just takes a. It's just taking me longer than I, you know, than I. Than you expected. Yeah, than I expected. But yeah, I learned a lot there at Wild Card, and then um, going back to um, analyzing losses and analyzing my career, like around the tenth fight when I was uh, working with with Flaming Hot with Chris Guevara. That's when I started noticing. You know what? Like I am getting better with them. You know, things, yeah. things are going better. But I had to break, almost break off from wild card because i was so like in in uh what's i was so invested in in that whole community yeah. you know but i started understanding what it meant to be a, a boxer and what it meant to be a better fighter and a world-class fighter more just because i was able to train with them and then um i made this decision to leave wild card and and focus on like myself you can say right right so now so then i i, I moved from hollywood to anaheim so now I'm, I'm based in anaheim and i train out of real boxing so we've been training now like like full like full time in Anaheim for like the last three three and a half years. Now 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 here's another question for you. So like, do you think if a a fighter is not spiritually um, at peace, he could still be a great fighter? Or does your personal life play an impact on everything else? I think every I think every fighter is different from the like. I like comparing myself to the best fighters I've met, not not to like you know any boxer. So I, I think the best fighters, 
have an insane work ethic and discipline yeah and have like that switch of of when to focus for me i switch it on i try to change personalities or i try to like i'm when i when i fight i try to be more angry be more um be more of a like a like a, a jerk you know just not like not care um but like have be a be calm and, and cool at the same time well i'm i'm not going to name any names but like there are certain people that walk around with a persona is that real or like do, do like in a fight in a boxing promotion um i know that that plays well for ticket sales and yeah, things so, of that so nature that's the thing i've learned like the, the business of it right now that i have my own business that i understand what it means to make money now i i look at myself as a business now as a fighter too right right and whether it be taking a certain amount of fights seeing what offers you're offering me you know knowing what's bs and what's not but yeah for example with jake paul right talking shit right right s- selling the fight i'm mean, uh, talking you know smack selling yeah. the fight same with uh conor mcgregor people people really hate on them but i i look at it from a business perspective my like, wow i'm that's impressive man the, the amount of money and, and attention they can generate at the end of the day you you're you're an entertainer and you're fighting to to entertain right. entertain the world well like i just saw that uh Tyrone Woodley um meeting that they had and um they were sitting across from each other and um they were talking about you know how he said something to his mom and then Tyrone Woodley the whole i don't know if you've seen that press conference the whole press conference got up and they were all about to uh you know get in a squabble with each other and I, you know, to be honest with you, nowadays, like, I don't know if that's a, a genuine or I don't know if that's like, because it's, it, this has been going on for years with, with other fighters. And I'm like, okay, is it, this is either a business move or it's genuine. I don't know if fighters are testosterone driven and they just, you know, want to get in each other's faces because they, they truly dislike each other. But they, you know, Jake Paul and Tyrone really know they're going to make a lot of money. They, they've already signed the contract. I mean, unless you're talking about uh, generating more ticket sales um, through through doing things like that, then it makes sense if you if you want to uh, fool the people that aren't going to second question that, you know? Yeah, I think, like you just said, it's the fact that you don't know. So, like, already you're going to want to be, you're going to want to watch, you know? Right. Even, even if you don't know. What, True. Whether, even with you, whether, whether you know or not, you want to see that the end of that tale. Yeah. Um. Actually, and and I I think Tyrone Woodley's a dangerous guy. This is where we get into business. I don't know. Right, right, right. Jake Paul is, I think he's a cash cow right now. So I don't know if he like you know put some money on the side for him or whatever. But I've sparred Tyrone Woodley. Um, I no had, way. I had a I had a uh, holy I, smokes, dude. I, I had a power trainer like to help me punch harder. His mm-hmm. name was Arnold Chan. Mm-hmm. So we trained in Hollywood, and he he cornered uh, Tyrone Woodley a few times in his UFC fights. So this was like three four years ago. So when Tyrone Woodley was like you know I. I still think he's a top athlete, but yeah, man, that that guy's a tank. He's he's solid. He, I mean, I know he's got a good uh, overhand right, and he, and for a long time in the UFC, he did he did well. But uh, towards the end, towards the end, he lost I think two or three fights, and uh, I think it was actually I'm sorry, I think it was even three or four um, fights that he lost towards the tail end of his MMA career. I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily know if that's done or not, whether he goes to Bellator or sticks with the UFC. But um, I could tell you this, um, in his prime, he was super dangerous. Nobody wanted to touch him. Um, I know Kamara Usman got him, but Kamara Usman, that guy's even more dangerous because he's, he's kind of like what you would call a technical striker. And so Kamara Usman has the power, and he's got the, the techni- uh, technicalities to, like, defeat him. Um, what I was going to tell you, though, was, um, yeah, going back to the, the hype train, um, yeah, I don't... I don't really know, but you're right. Psychologically, for the average fan, even if you do know, even if you do know, you kind of want to buy the pay per view. Like I'm not gonna lie, I'm, you know, I'm obviously I'm a lot older than you are. I've been around a lot longer. I'm not too too old, but I'm I'm still in the pocket of the the Chavez days, and and I've seen the transition from, uh, in the way that uh, social media has played an impact on, you know, um. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, 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 marketing and uh, trademarking. And, yeah, trade marketing and and the way Jake Paul came up, he didn't come up as a boxer. He came up as a YouTuber and him and his brother and and now he's in boxing. Yeah, and and I, 
I kind of laugh at the fact that a lot of boxers are 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 mad at that, right? Right. And I mean, I would be mad too if like he's making a lot more money than I am, and I've been boxing all my life, and I'm a world champion. But then you got to look at the fact that you know he did his work, you know, before boxing. He he did his audience work. That's 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 a different type of work. But you know, you got to respect that too. But I think at the end of the day, he's bringing attention to boxing. You know, he's he's making boxing trending and pop culture, and that's what you want. Who? Why would he want to be a boxer, be at the top of the uh, the boxing game, and and have like culture not care about that? Right, right. You know, it's but but I think the jealousy is driven, at, to to simplify it, it's driven by money. Yeah. Like you're not in a a good position, and and I think that works the same way for a lot of other things in life. Like you're not in that position to make that money. You you didn't put yourself in that position for whatever reason. So you're on the sideline looking at a boxer. Or somebody that's barely started in boxing and you're like wow how is that guy making millions and I've been doing this the whole time so I like my personal opinion is I think that boxers kind of look at these social media marketing guys or the the MMA crossover fights Ben Askren Jake Paul like nobody wanted that to happen really but man Ben Askren you know he he lost uh, you know, a couple fights in the UFC the only the only one he really uh, won was with Robbie Lawler and he choked him out and even that was questionable. And then he goes on to find Jake Paul, makes millions, and walk away. People are like, did he throw the fight? Or was that a genuine fight? You know, did Jake Paul pay him to throw the fight? Yeah, it's, it's crazy once once money gets involved. It's different, you know, when you have a family to feed. Yeah, it's totally different. And I think that's been my motivation, too, to be more marketable. Like, let's say talk more, more smack than I would usually do. Um, try to be more flashy. Yeah. You know? It, initially it was it wasn't something that I, I like to do but now you know it's kind of fun it's like like you said you're creating a different persona you're you're drawing more attention and at the end of the day the more attention you drive to to yourself the more opportunities open up and the more leverage you have so yeah there's, there's a fighter out there by the name of uh, he's an MMA fighter uh, by the name of Colby Covington he was he wasn't nobody was paying attention to him he trained with Jorge Masvidal uh, and then nobody was nobody was looking his way he was winning fights but nobody cared. Then he started going with this like uh, Trump train thing and went out to all the events with megaphones. Now people want to see him fight. And I, I you know, it goes back to that same thing. Um, but um, do you think that um, between certain fighters, like animosity is real or? I think it is. I really do. Just because I, I've been in, I've been there like the, like the before face off, you know, where you just look at the person and I, I like face-offs to be to be honest because i I'm do you like, get heated yeah, in a face-off i i for me it's more like i i know if, if i'm going to dominate you or not like i know if you're scared or not just by by your eye contact no I mean, you yeah, can look at that yeah i can look at that so i i, I practice i mean i practice like my stare down you know at myself you know Dang. yeah i want to be like i want to make sure i'm very competitive so i want to make sure that i win like every little thing before leading up to the fight so i can have that advantage it's like it's all those little things that up I've seen I've seen uh, uh, face-offs or stare downs, and uh, I always think like because you know they they have these betting sites where you can bet, and like I know one of my sons he bets on those sites, and um, I was like, man, it's hard to gauge sometimes people's uh, face like from the face-off, and then you look at the stature of people sometimes, and I look at the fighters, I'm like, well, man, he didn't look as big, you know, he, he looked good in training, but now that they're staring at each other in the in the stare down. Like he looks a lot smaller, bro. Like I don't know. Like yeah. and, and like it's hard to determine because those fighters end up sometimes the smaller guys end up winning. Yeah, it, it's it, it's like you can't you can't underestimate your body. Bodies are different. Everyone's everyone's built different. Um, so that's 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 I think that's the trickiest part. Sometimes you think you know what like this guy's shorter than me. I have this advantage, and next thing you know, he's like right under you, like pressing you, and his his disadvantage becomes his advantage. So you have to be ready for everything. Okay, where'd you get the name? It's the thrill, right? Yeah, the, the thrill. The, the I think the thrill came up with um, again. Uh, my first ring name was uh, La Rata, the, the rat, just because I um, when I was I was a boxing gym rat. Like I was always to the boxing gym. Yeah. Like, growing up, so I was like the little rat. I was the youngest kid hanging out with the pros. So they, you know, they they, they named you. Know that. How Mexicans are? They like they give you the worst possible. Yeah, name, yeah, yeah. And then it sticks <laughs> to you. So for two years, <laughs> I'm like, nah, don't call me, don't call me that. So then some people, some people, the ones that the OGs that know me, they still call me that. And I'm like, hey, 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 hey. I respond those, to like, yeah, like don't my, say that in front of people. Yeah, I respond to like it's my like. 
like my name, Brian. I'm like, oh, hey, what's up? <laughs> That's not an insult. But then, you know, again, uh, knowing how to market my name, starting to look at bigger opportunities, something that's where, let's say, sponsors are willing to invest. You know, you got to change the name. So then the thrill came up. I think I, I've always liked the word thrill because yeah. it's, it gives you excitement. and it's, Yeah, it's a really high yeah, energy word. It's, for not, it's, not, it's not reckless. It's not, I'm not a reckless person. It's not reckless, but it's more... Um, at least for me, it, it it embodies what I feel when I fight. It gives you an, it gives you an emotion, it gives me a rush, and it it heightens my senses for me. So I think that in itself is a thrill, and you want to you know get people to show, be a thriller. Um, so it, it has ver- it's it's very mar- it's a very marketable name, and I think we just we just we're we're just brainstorming names, and you know it just came up, and it just you know I I love that name. Um, I know the audience can't see your belt, but can can I uh, can I? T- I'm gonna show the the people in a uh, YouTube land and and everybody. Look at this magnificent belt right here, man. I, so what's the plans going forward? I'm gonna show this to the other camera. What's the plans going forward for you, man? What, I'm I'm trying to get a bigger belt. I'm trying to get like more rings around it. This is like Latin American countries. I'm trying to get like a continental. I, I, the goal is the world world title belt. You know those ones are a bit bigger, similar color scheme, but yeah, that's a goal. I mean. I've been in the ring with with world champions. I've I've sparred world champions. I've 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 handled. I have I have a good pedigree mentally. I'm there. My my body physically is finally catching up. I think that's probably the thing I've worked the most in the past years, getting stronger. Yeah. And I, and I feel strong. Um, I'm pretty big for my weight class. I fight at 154. Yeah. So uh, you know I usually walk around like once 170 or like 15, 17 pounds over or like over my weight class. But um, and that's me in shape. So. I just feel like I, I I can cut weight really easily. Like my body's responding well. Like I, I think everything's aligning for me, and I've prepared my body for so long now that you know I'm ready for those. I'm ready to to, to test my body and and get those bigger fights and challenge myself. Test it to the limits, yeah, right? Test my limits, yeah. And then at the position I'm in right now, just because of the number of fights I have and, and the way I've managed my career so far, I'm able to take those um, those bigger fights right away. I'm, I'm able to to get bigger huh? fights. I, I'm going backwards on this question, but I I don't think I asked this one before you went pro. How many amateur fights did you have? I had about like forty five, forty six. Wow. Amateur fights, and yeah, I, I fought with a lot of good competition. Um, I would always make it to the finals of every every tournament I would get to. Um, like I said, I, I I've won the Golden Gloves. Um, you won. ever think about fighting Olympics? I that that was the goal when when I I. I, I fought in a tournament where I, I got the bronze medal. Yeah. Um, the USA Nationals, because it was about two years before the Olympics. And then I was thinking, like, okay, like, the only guy who beat me is the guy who's on the Olympic team, right? So I'm yeah. thinking, like, can I do this? But then financially, it just didn't make sense because I was in college, like, yeah. with no money. Yeah. You know, so I, I had to I had turn pro. And it, it was like a very a high risk, high reward situation. Um, and I wasn't willing to put my family through that financial burden, and you know, I'm very independent too. So it just it was the best decision to turn pro and 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 get started, right? Because everything even back then was like a a what if. It was a what if. Yeah. I guess that's that's been like my my boxing. Um, it's been it's honestly it's been a hobby that now is is a passion, and and now I I, I see thing I see my goals right, like those world title fights. I see those. Those championship level uh, uh, fighters that I want to fight within grass for I'm already watching TV. I'm like, all right, I know I'm gonna fight him soon. Yeah. So um, that motivates me more, and, and that brings my my work ethic to a higher level. and makes me focus more. It's 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 so it's like that coffee. I want to grab. It's like so close that you know. Yeah, I, I, and I think I think the yeah. what ifs probably come from just the financial aspect and the, what's in the best interest for your life. Um, you know, the other thing is too, man. I find you such an uh, I find your work ethic uh, admirable, and I always uh, even wonder about your other the other aspects of your life. I know you do uh, music marketing, right? Or yeah, what, what so, is that you do? So, so I, I went to Loyola Marymount University. I graduated with a bachelor's in business administration, nice. and then uh, pretty much a Spanish language minor too. So, um. Everything in life works out for me. Like I said, some I, I put it in my head out where I want to be, and then my sub, either my subconscious face, you know, my like I'm very into with my spirituality, energy, like it, it all just flows to that purpose. Um, so I pretty much 
did a I took Spanish classes in college because I, I needed to like have a good GPA in college too you know I was a good student always been a good student but now I use that Spanish uh, degree pretty much that I had my minor that I had because I, I write proposals in Spanish I, sp I speak in Spanish um, actual like you know professional Spanish yeah language. not like the slang yeah not slang Spanish like, like orderly yeah, here's a <laughs> yeah the Spanish language because right after I graduated I turned pro so my focus was like I'm I'm gonna focus on boxing now which I was I was focused on boxing but then I had a lot of free time between fights I'm like what am I doing right and I, I needed to make money too because I did have some sponsors were helping but I always think about my life okay what if you don't have those people what if you can't you know count on that support so I pretty much made my own business with my I had to make my own business right away. I, I started working with some older colleagues from high school that, you know, they're very successful now too. But they kind of mentored me in, in, in the digital space. I learned how to make websites. I didn't go to school for websites, but I learned how to make websites with them. And then on YouTube, graphic design, started picking up stuff. And I guess that entrepreneurial spirit grew out of necessity in order to keep boxing my main focus. You know, uh, I, I'm gonna stop you right there. I know you you can beat me in boxing, but I know you can't beat me in graphic design. <laughs> I just want to put that out. Yeah, there. <laughs> no, no, I, I I understand that. Like, I'm, I'm messing with you, bro. No, no, no. Um, no. I've learned like I'm the champ there, bro. <laughs> so now I have like designers. Like I I outsource I, I out of my work, so I know some good designers that are. That's all they do, you know. No, I'm playing with you, bro. I'm, so, I'm, I'm, <laughs> it's all it's all good. But yeah, I mean, I think my my business. I, my business what's the name of your business bro it's called the uh, formula digital formula digital look yeah. look them up on the uh instagram or yeah. what, what's your instagram handle uh, so it's formula f-o-r-m-u-l-a and then d-l okay and and i know you work with some high high-end artists man yeah, so so pretty much uh, uh like a long story shorter was pretty much i um i started doing some some snapchat campaigns with for these reggaeton artists yeah in puerto rico um I had a buddy who made like these these filters on Snapchat, so I got really involved with the whole Snapchat app. At the time, it was like the number one app, right? Yeah. Like, it's like Instagram. So, long, uh, long story short, I got connected with a lot of managers in Puerto Rico, and then I didn't know at the time, but Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico is very small. I visited the country, but it's very small. So, like the music industry, that are small, but it's it's like the like the hotbed. It's like it's mm. like it's like East LA boxing or like boxing in LA. Like there's so many good fighters. There's so much good talent in Puerto Rico. So what 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 are the uh, genres that are in Puerto Rico that are strong? Is it like reggaeton? Yeah, it's or? like re reggaeton. That's where like it came out of reggaeton, like trap, like Spanish trap. Um, so pretty much think like like it was like a '90s hip hop, but this was like 2016, right? Like right yeah. before it blew up. So I started doing some small campaigns for these managers. W within a short months, I got to Daddy Yankee's manager. Oh, I got to like Arcan's manager, you know, and I started noticing that these people were more like street they had like that that street mentality that street mentality which i don't want to say they weren't educated but they didn't they didn't have like that like that like that college a degree under the belt they had well like puerto, puerto rico i mean not to to downplay them or anything but th that country is going through a lot right like yeah yeah i mean it's it's dangerous i mean i'm i've known colleagues that have been killed right in, in the music wow yeah, that's crazy um yeah, because yeah, their government's not right, and even when they had that flood a while back, like even we went over there and we we're like, here's some toilet paper, but it, it wasn't cool. Like they don't get the attention that they deserve. Yeah, exactly. It's 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 rough out there. Like the hood, hood. It's like the hood, hood. Right? Yeah, it's like yeah. third world kind of hood. Yeah, yeah. It's it's, it's really rough. rough out That's there. rough, man. But again, like the hood creates like uh, those diamonds. Pressure, that, pressure makes diamonds. Yeah, pressure yeah. makes diamonds. So there's a lot of good artists that come out over there. So I've been fortunate enough to visit those places to understand like the psychology of these artists and understand like you know their backstory but yeah so i started R ridiculous question you're fluent in spanish but yeah. is, is the spanish there different yeah it's different they have they have an accent that, yeah it's, it's hard to understand yeah, huh? it's kind of cool yeah but, 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 yeah but uh, it was different because these puerto ricans like the managers they started calling me papi and yeah and, and baby mi rey my my king right and yeah they translate to my king like oh no my king no this is a misunderstanding hey baby how you doing you yeah know? it's a trip bro because i i've heard that like i've heard and, and like in our culture our, our culture is like more machismo so like you call like somebody hey papi like it's just like some people may get offended from that you know yeah. they may be like dude what are you calling me your papi for like you know yeah. uh, but 
No, I get it. I get it. Like, yeah, they have terms of endearment. Same with Colombians and 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 Dominicans too. So my my Spanish now is a little bit mixed up between Puerto Rican, <laughs> Dominican, <laughs> Colombian. Hey, that's cool, dude. Yeah. So, hey, you could chop it up with anybody. Yeah, I'm, I'm able to understand. Maybe like you know, my I can chop it up too, but I can finally understand like what they mean and and their and their slang because there's yeah. no slang in the in the Spanish language. But yeah, pretty much got connected with all these like big managers. And then the whole reggaeton industry blew up at the same time. So I was able to work with artists like Bad Bunny, who was like the number one. Oh, yeah, he's number one right now. Number dude. one. Uh, Osuna was someone I worked with a lot. I still like work with Osuna, you know. Um, uh, who else? Uh, Arcangel, Daddy Yankee, Nacho Daddy. Dasha. So like, Gasoline. Yeah, so I, w- I found it unique that I had direct contact with these managers. I, I found out later that a lot of people go through the label and then to the artists, right? Or like companies work with like a label then which that label talks to like xy person which talks to the manager so it's like three or five people before you get to the person but i i'd go direct to the manager right because they want to get everyone in puerto rico they want the hottest thing so they want the direct plug yeah so that's nobody why. wants to go through like 10 different channels to get to the guy exactly so like i was the guy i was like the snapchat guy i didn't work for snapchat i told him hey you guys gotta focus on latin america I'll work for you guys. Well, the one thing, the one thing, uh, like that, I notice about Latino people, like, cause I, I do web design and all that stuff, is that they don't want the burden of trying to figure the software or whatever the app is out. If you know how to do it, they're gonna go to you, and they're just gonna, and, and if you're connected, psh, that's even better. Like they're gonna be like, I, that guy trusts this guy, so I can trust this guy. Exactly, and that's where it was. And I think at the beginning, you know, I was like 23, 24. I talked to, I talked to talk. I, you know, I extended the truth a lot. And in my head, I was like, damn, like, hope I don't get caught. You know, for, I think one of the, the best stories I had for my business career was I knew Daddy Yankee was coming to Staples Center to have a concert with Don Omar, like at the end of August. Mm. And then at this time, like Snapchat was like the one app and um, they weren't taking me seriously. I just knew they were replying late to my emails. And I was like, hey, like I can bring Daddy Yankee to the office. I, I didn't know if I could. Yeah, you just did it. I, I just knew it wasn't coming down, but I knew I had his manager's contact. And then they're like, they replied right away. Okay, yeah, when can you make it happen? And I had to like put up the front, like, oh, you know what? Like, maybe I maybe I can make him come next week if if you know if you guys have time, blah blah. blah. Like, yeah, yeah, we have time, everything. So I got the green light on them. So then I went to that Yankees manager. And I was like, hey, Snapchat wants to meet with you. He, they they want to offer some like cool stuff just for him. Yeah. You know? So I I played both sides, and then you know he ended up coming. Like he pulled up. Like when I told him he was gonna pull up, and that gave me a lot of backing from both like you know a big company like snapchat and then like that gave me backing from like daddy yankee who's like the godfather of that whole industry right yeah so then i was able to name drop him name drop his manager's name with other uh, other artists so then they trusted me so then i started bringing more artists through i started you doing uh, more app work with you know twitter instagram campaigns digital campaigns so i started seeing that need for like you said these people are more like hood they're sh- very street street smart very wealthy right you know? um and you know when you have money, you don't. You rather just do give gives it gives this complicated job, which is digital, to someone that you can trust. And then, yeah. You know, if if these guys are using Daddy Yankee's guy, then come on, it's Daddy Yankee, so like they're gonna they're gonna use the best of the best. Yeah, they're gonna use the best of the best. And so they... yeah, so then over that over the years, I've just been connecting with people, managers, going to events too, like actual meet, meeting artists, you know, having good relationships with like some of the best artists in the world, and then seeing that right. For example, Os- seeing Osuna perform like from like the Roomba Room that's when I first met him oh I remember that yeah, he's yeah perform- I used to do shows there performing at the Roomba Room and, and you know he he took me to a, a, a Vegas one time to perform like in he had a concert at Chaos at the time but yeah. a sold out crowd like it, it was packed but I was like right next to him and it was just like seeing that growth so going back again to my life you know seeing like okay like I'm, I see growth in my career you know so that that inspired me to to show me like you know what like this guy's a normal person because I talk to him on, on you know on a regular basis I'm like you know what like this guy's cool like he just like he just his talent is that he just just sings really well and incredibly well actually yeah so then you know it that inspires me so meeting like these artists these people have those relationships so now like what I'm doing just because I already have that work relationship with them is I'm starting to tell people hey guess what I'm a boxer too now you know yeah do you find yourself um like racing between the two like seeing which one you're going to grow more in because you know your boxing career is taking off and and 
you know, to me, I've always enjoyed the music industry. And in, and if you ask people that have, have been in my life, I, it's like a piece of me that I can't leave behind. Like I'm 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 here doing radio now. I've I've been involved in production. I've been involved, you know, making making beats, and I've also been on stage. And it's just some. It's a part of me that that I can't really leave. So I kind of from my normal life and and you know the the music life, I take enjoyment in both of them. But do you find yourself in the same position where you're kind of like, you know what? I, I, I could take off with my marketing company. I yeah. could take off in boxing. How do you how do you divide your attention between the two? Yeah, so like when when I started, um, I, I had to focus a lot on my, on my, on my building a company because that's where you're like, I'm making money through there more than boxing, right? Right. So I actually took like, I think it was one, I took one, one year off boxing pretty much and I like, went to Puerto Rico for like three months. I lived there three months just so I can work with these artists. Wow. Yeah. So that was like in 20, I think 2017 or something, right? It takes a lot of guts to do that, man. Yeah, and I and I knew people there. So, but but that to me was like thrilling, you know. At the time, it was like you know I was enjoying it. How old were you at that time? I was probably like 20, 20s. 25, 25. Yeah, wow. I was 25. But yeah, like being with like the biggest artists in the world. Yeah, yeah how just, cool is that? Yeah, just like you know being with them. But I, I get over things real fast. So then, right now, I'm I'm at the point where it's like okay, like who's I think about it like. Whose dream am I gonna work on, mine or someone else's? Yeah, you know? yeah, because that's what it boils down to, right? Yeah. You ever get start? Does does your uh, does your ambition ever get starstruck? Like, do you say, oh well, sh you know, I I got Daddy Yankee in my pocket. I'm I'm, I'm just using Daddy Yankee as an example. Yeah. But like, it could be anybody. Like that, uh, like you get so hyped up that that drives your like you stayed in Puerto Rico. So, so like I said the first like 2 3 years yeah I mean I, I was getting invited to like these award shows I'm like getting nice. the, and the whole industry was blowing up too right like uh this uh Osuna started make Osuna started making songs with like Selena Gomez you know there's like yeah big names yeah big names same with Daddy Yankee was making songs with Katy Perry I was like damn like, I just saw the boom right away like Bad Bunny just exploded out of nowhere so I started seeing all these I'm like you know what I I'm I'm one person away from these people because I, yeah. I either talk with the artist or their manager, you know. So that in itself rose my stock value by context. Even to this day, you know, I can I can reach reach people, out reach reach out directly to the people, and I have that backing from them that whatever I say, they trust because I've never lied. I always come through. I have a really good reputation in the industry, right? Which is really good. It's really good and really hard to yeah, to get yeah, because people, everybody everybody hypes things up and that's the one thing that i've learned a lot of people are like oh i'll get you connected to this i'll do that and they, they give you the daps they give you the hand daps and uh most time people are blowing smoke yeah so that, that's when my boxing strategy came into place you know i i've always known like which moves to make which people to hit up um obviously like it's not all like it's not all like peachy a peachy dream. right yeah but i've been i've been well I, just like boxing boxing's yeah, not all peachy yeah, I've, I've been screwed over in in deals I've, I've had people that owe me money to this day i've had people that owe me money that i've had to like forget just because they're connected with someone else that i, I want oh to that's you know that so bites it's a little bit of like like a just it's like how have you seen, ever seen have you seen house of cards you know people yeah play, play yeah it's like favors that's it's like a whole different industry but it, that's what gives me thrill in that industry right the thrill um, yeah the thrill so that keeps things exciting because you know i i'm like okay i got to this guy because i went through this guy you know and yeah and and people understand your genius too or they understand how how you get to a certain point yeah because at the end of the day i think at one point i was like backstage right at, a, at an award show that um i don't know if you know artists but there was daddy yankee was in the room uh yandel was in the room i know that both those guys like yeah. Like the like the their manager in the room like they're, like the, nobody else was there and then it was me and like I I, I was thinking in my head like dude I'm I'm a Mexican kid I'm not Puerto Rican yeah like, I haven't been with these guys from their beginning of careers I'm like every everywhere I went there I was like the youngest guy in the room right so I was like damn I'm doing something right because yeah know, everyone's uh, already like you know it's hard to get in that position without putting in a lot of work yeah so and, so, so, so so boxing gave me that uh, that work ethic but. I didn't, I didn't feel it just because I'm used to like that that discipline so then yeah after I saw that I started getting o I started getting over those events I started you know after the fourth fifth award show I was like you know what like this is getting old I already know what's gonna happen you know yeah you know and then like even being with artists like that doesn't drive me I'd rather talk to the manager and get my money you know what that's it it's cool you know it's it's like I said it's whose whose career am I building like mine or 
or someone else's, you know. And I've had those opportunities. I've had oppor- opportunities to be, like, be in an entourage of these big artists, right? That they invited me, where they would go like on tour or like, you know, they go travel the world and be like, hey, I want you on my team, you know, twenty four seven. But it's like it's it's not worth it anymore. I really like built myself enough where I have my business running and I don't have to worry about it and I can do it from the, my laptop from home and you know I can go to the gym and focus on myself and then come back work a little a few hours and then keep focusing on boxing yeah times are times are definitely changed where you don't need to be on site at a place you can work you know at, at the uh, convenience of a hotel room or so I mean I that that's a pretty awesome part of that job um, um, and then you know um, just to have all those connections, man, those, that's priceless. Yeah, and I've been, like you said, I, I guess I was living like the, the COVID life, the, the the lockdown life of like working anywhere from home like since like 2016, you know. I've been able to work from like Colombia. I've gone to, Puerto, like I said, Puerto Rico. Um, I went to Dubai on a job there too. Like it, it was it just cool. My, my education and my like my business has taken me to a lot of places. But... Well, it, well... Uh, you know, I want to uh, thank you for coming on today. It's, it's been a great interview. I'm sure I could sit here and talk all day with you. Yeah. Um, I want to thank you for taking the time to come out to our station. You know, we are a, a nonprofit station here in, in Orange County, and you did take the time to come out. So I appreciate you. Thank you for that. Um, but I also want to give you the opportunity to uh, plug anything that you want to plug and then uh, give uh, send any shout-outs or messages to yeah, anybody. Yeah, yeah. Um, just to everyone listening, I appreciate you for giving me your ears, giving me your attention. That means everything to me. I'm really big on, on giving back as well. Um, I donate to a lot of underprivileged kids in Mexico, I'm doing a lot of events. So for anyone that wants to follow my journey and, and be a part of my team, you can follow me on all socials at Brian Tony Flores. That's what the Y. So B-R-Y-A-N-T-O-N-Y-F-L-O-R-E-S, Brian Tony Flores. I'm excited for for these next months. I'm I'm gonna be fighting my biggest fights. I'm 100% zoned in on boxing right now. I'm elevating my game. I'm working harder. I'm training twice as hard, and I just feel good things coming. You know, I feel like my whole life are prepared for for these fights that are coming up. So I'm I'm focused and I'm I'm locked in. I, I have everything. That's awesome, man. And and uh, you can catch all of the uh, video that we're taking. Uh, today on Radio Suerte's website, uh, RadioSuerte.com, uh, we're gonna rebroadcast this as well as um, my YouTube, my my YouTube channel. Let's talk about it, um, and uh, we'll be putting Brian's uh, links to all the social media and the marketing company has up there. Um, if you have any questions from, you know, I'll be sure to direct that to Brian. And uh, shout out to uh, everybody out there that's tuned into this interview. Shout out to Bugatti AP. Uh, shout out to uh, Jose, even though you didn't make it. Uh, shout out to Valerie, uh, Valdez, Armin, all uh, Jace. Um, happy birthday to uh, Marky, and then uh, everybody out there that has tuned in to Radio Suerte and supported our organization. Stay tuned. We got a lot of good things coming. Maria Luisa Luna. Thank you to her. Thank you to uh, Victor Mendez and Olivia. Um, we are here, Radio Suerte. I'm playing some more good music uh, for you right now.